Hello. I am so happy to be here. I wanted to share. Well, actually, first off, I'm a kindergarten teacher, full day kindergarten teacher from Las Vegas, Nevada. So unlike a lot of your weather, my weather is I think it's like 50s and 60s. So I have no coat on. It's really nice. No, no snow, which is in or ice, which is a really good thing. So um, I'm in my classroom right now. It's after school. And um, so I'm so happy that you are here joining me for um, anchor charts in the kindergarten classroom. So here is my family. First, I wanted to share to so my husband. We've been married for 20 years. And then my oldest, he is a senior in high school this year, graduating. And my daughter, she's 11 in sixth grade. And then my youngest one actually goes here to my school and he's in fourth grade here. So and there's a, some pictures from my classroom and um, from some of my students. So that gives you a little insight into me. And so thank you again for joining me. Um, as we talk about anchor charts, it's a passion of mine. If I, if I showed you all around my classroom, you would see anchor charts everywhere because I'm a huge believer in anchor charts. And um, we're going to talk about the purpose behind them, how to create them, how to make them interactive, how to make them meaningful, and then what to do with them once you're finished. And um, so we're going to start with this. So this first slide I have up says, um, is there a difference? And it used to be years ago, if you've been in teaching, let's say longer than 10 years, you would go to a teacher store and you would get posters and you would get charts that were pre-printed and you would bring them back to your classroom and you'd hang them up and then your kids would come in on the first day of school or after winter break and you would have these fancy, beautiful printed charts on the wall. And what we found out through research was that um, they're really not meaningful, as meaningful as they could be. And one of the missing components is that um, they are not, uh, the children are really not having an input and a say into um, what is actually being put into the classroom. And we know through research that if children have an, if students have an input um, in the classroom, it's much more meaningful to them. So is there a difference between, between pre-printed and creating um, with your students? I think so. And I hope that after today's webinar, you will too. So what are anchor charts? Anchor charts, it's a visual tool and you, hopefully you are creating it with your students to support their learning. And it includes relevant concepts and specific strategies for students to visually access around the room if needed. Again, going back to that um, poster that you might have purchased years ago, um, a lot of times like it just becomes a decoration on the wall. But when you make an anchor chart, the students tend to take ownership over it because they had a part in it. Um, you can see the anchor chart right here. That's a circle map, an alphabet circle map. All those words and, all the, and the pictures, obviously, going along with the words were generated by my students together. So we did that together as a class. So when I um, am te doing explicit teaching on each individual letter, we make an anchor chart together. And again, I'm looking over here because I have all of my alphabet anchor charts hanging up in my classroom. And they stay there all year long. Again, I have that luxury. I have the space in my classroom and we'll get to that later on in the webinar about for those of you that don't have the space or the fire marshal says you can't hang things from the ceiling. And again, do what your building and your principal always says. Please don't go back and say, and say um, Abigail Peterson from Kindergarten Chaos told me to do this. I don't want to get in trouble with the fire department or your, your admin. So always do what your admin and your building and your fire codes um, dictate. But I know that, um, well, for me, I'm allowed to hang them up in my classroom and my students utilize them all year long. So they will go when they're writing and they'll say, oh, they knew that they added the word crown or they, or, uh, they added the word goat to an, the anchor chart. And um, they will find them and they will use them. So um, they can be very meaningful if you use them and create them with the students. So why do we create anchor charts? Anchor charts anchor the learning. That's hence the name anchor charts. They visually assist the teacher um, in instruction and during the lesson. And they can be displayed or saved for repeat exposure and as a guide for future reference. So I'm going to share some of the anchor charts that I've made in the classroom and how I've had to revisit them and pull them back out to um, talk about that concept again. It builds a culture of literacy in the classroom. So again, when my kids come in the start of the year, there's not very much on, on my walls. It's pretty much um, actually nothing really, not a whole lot of print. And then together we build the classroom community 
together by building these anchor charts. It makes learning relevant. Students buy into it a lot more because they had a part and they take ownership in it. And then also it's a part of interactive learning. So here's some tools that I suggest that you use for um, making anchor charts. My favorite anchor chart markers are these Sharpie markers. Um, they're called flip chart and they're made by the brand Sharpie. I was at first using um, Mr. Sketch markers and um, I forget what the other ones. They're like the smelly markers too. Like there's Mr. Sketch and then there's another one. And what I found was that being in this room with the fluorescent lighting, it would fade over time just because probably, you know, whatever they're made of. But when I use the Sharpie markers, they don't fade to the extent that the Mr. Sketch and the other markers do. So they're my favorite and they don't bleed through because they are made for flip charts. They're made for this chart paper. And then if you can afford it, it is kind of expensive, but my school um, is a big believer in anchor charts and supporting what the teachers need in the classroom. So my school provides me with the Post-it brand um, easel paper. And it's, so it's sticky on the back. And that is um, helpful because if you can see some of my anchor charts hanging up here in the classroom, they're, um, they're actually on my whiteboard and it's just the sticky back um, because it's the Post-it brand. So that's my favorite. I had some um, people donate, it was actually like recycled paper and it just tore so easily and it was, I didn't care for it. So I really try to stick to the Post-it brand. And then another thing I have that I think if you, again, if you can, is to get a classroom clothesline. And I got this on Amazon. And it comes with two 50 foot like clothesline ropes and I have it strung in my classroom and then it comes with the um, clothes pins. And that's how we hang a lot of my anchor charts. And I actually only have had to use one and I have a pretty big classroom, but um, this is just a way to hang anchor charts in your classroom um, purposely and kind of utilizing that space that no you normally wouldn't use. Another thing I do is I use, I'm going to grab them real fast. I like to use these giant um, uh, clothespins. I've gotten them at Joann's Craft Store, at Michael's. Target had them one year. But um, I use these as kind of like my anchor chart holders. And what I do is I glue, and I don't use hot glue. <laughs> I learned the, the, um, the hard way. I used hot glue one time to glue on these like thumbtacks. Well, it doesn't stick very well. So this is actually E6000 glue, which is like very stinky, um, but it actually works really well. So I E6000 the thumbtack onto these large clothespins. And then I have these in my wall and I have them as anchor chart holders. And these will hold probably um, four to six of the, of the Post-it brand paper these large clothespins. I also have used regular clothespins, but it just doesn't um, hold as much. So again, you can find these. I think they have them on Amazon too, but check Joann's, Michael's, Target has had them, and then E6000 for the thumbtacks. So that's what I use. All right, so now we're getting down to, now we know why we use anchor charts, why they're important, and um, now we're gonna, and, and the anchor chart tools, now it's time to make an anchor chart. So what's the first step in making an anchor chart? And that is, what is your concept or standard? What is it you're trying to, um, what, are, what, is your, what is your goal? What is your goal? So I always take that and I'm, and I, so for instance, like this one behind here, um, we were working on this standard, the difference between a letter, a word and a sentence. So I have my goal in mind and I know what I'm going to do. And then I call it building the bones and building the bones for me is like putting the border around it is um, maybe maybe I might draw the big picture. But then everything else, um, adding the words and adding I want the kids to be a part of that. So I just have the basic skeleton. Again, I call it building the bones, just the skeleton. So if you see on the slide right here, you can see. This is um, a chart that I use for when I'm going through numbers, um, zero through 20. And so the bones for this chart would be all about, and then I have the little like little notes, and then I have the 10 frame. And then when we're actually doing the lesson, we'll fill everything in together as, as a class. And that, again, 
has that student teacher interaction, makes it interactive, and um, they buy into it a lot more. So here again, here's this one, not this exact one, um, but um, this is from last year. And this is exactly how I built this chart with the students was you saw how I built the bones. And then as I'm introducing the lesson and as I'm, as I'm talking about it, then um, I said, these are the letters. And so I already had that pre-printed on the sentence strip. I glued it, they watched me glue it on. And then I said, now you get a chance to go and what letter do you want to add to our chart? And I, everybody got a Sharpie and I had already pre-cut the little pieces of, um, of sentence strips. And then they went back to their table, they wrote the letter, they got to bring it back and they got to glue it on the chart. And then we did the words. So I glued the words and, you know, of course, sometimes these anchor charts are not built in a day. This particular one I usually spend three days on because we do all about letters and then the next day we do all about words and then the next day we do the sentence one and we do other activities with it, but it makes an impact. And then they can always refer. They always refer back to the anchor chart. And I can say, remember when we did the anchor chart, you know, letters and words and sentences? Oh, yeah, I remembered. And then you always have it there to refer to. So, and again, they took part in this. And so they have ownership with it. Making in anchor charts interactive. This is one of, this is kind of like my goal, not my goal in life, but like my goal in the classroom is to make it learning as fun and as interactive as I can. I want it to be purposeful. I want it to be meaningful. Um, but I don't want to just, you know, be the one always up in the front. I want my kids to take part in, in the learning because they're the ones who are learning. So every time I make an anchor chart, I try to think, can I make this interactive and how can I make it interactive? So here's some examples again, when we do um, beginning labeling, when we start labeling in kindergarten, um, I drew this picture. You can see it's a very simple picture. I'm not an artist. That's one question I get asked a lot is, well, what if I'm not an artist? Well, I'm not an artist. I'm not an art teacher. I just do my best. And it's a great lesson. If you see my sign up here, mistakes are part of learning. It's a great lesson in growth mindset because I let them know Mrs. Peterson is not an artist, but I'm going to try my best. And then, you know, my cat looks a little silly and they'll be like, Miss Peterson, your cat looks funny. And I'll be like, oh, I did my best. And then all the kids will chime in and say, oh, yeah, Miss Peterson, your cat. I like your cat. You know how they are. So I love kindergarten. They're amazing. And so um, beginning, so like this beginning label, labeling, I made the picture in front of them. And then I said, well, now, you know, I need to, I need to label this picture. And so I was like, can, you know, could anybody help me? And again, I already had my post-its already pre-cut. I just cut post-its down into a, like a little flag size. And then um, I did a couple, I modeled for them and I, I labeled a couple of the pictures, but then I let them have some of the flags and they got to come up and they got to label the, um, the anchor chart. Again, makes it interactive and makes it meaningful and purposeful. Same with this anchor chart right here, post-it notes. That's all it is, is poster no post-it notes. And I had pre, um, put numbers, um, a pre, a pre, <laughs> I pre, Prepared, I guess you could say. I was going to say pre-prepared, but I prepared while they were at specials, um, you know, these post-it notes with letters and with numbers. And then when they came in, I was like, we're going to, you know, we, we have to determine if it's a letter, or if it's a number. And everybody got one and then they got to come up to the anchor chart and put it. So just those little simple changes, instead of me just showing them a chart that says, these are numbers, these are letters. And this is, you know, the numbers are for counting and letters are um, to, for reading. No, I just, I made it interactive. So if, as long as you can make it interactive, I think um, there's, there's more buy-in and there's, the students connect with it a lot more. So here's building on a concept and a standard. So again, going back to what I said before about not every anchor chart is gonna be built in one day. I say built, but that's kind of how I feel is I feel like it's a process and something that we're building and we're definitely um, building on these skills. And so. This was um, um, drawing with shapes, learning how to draw at the beginning of kindergarten. I can draw with shapes. And so, you know, I, I did, I modeled this, how I made this person using shapes. And then we labeled it. And, uh, you know, I, we, as you can see, I pointed out, oh, using rectangles for legs. And I used a circle for the head. And then, you know, at the bottom of the chart, don't forget your details. And then this is something that I, 
I keep hanging up in the writing station so that when they go to the writing station, that they can always refer to that. Oh, I do know how to draw a person because remember when we were, you know, when we um, work to build a, a person and using shapes and they can always refer back to that. So, and you can do this with any standard and with any concept. Um, again, uh, and I apologize. I'm just a kindergarten teacher. I am just a real person. So I, I should probably go to uh, Toastmasters and learn how to speak better, but I'm just, I'm just a regular person. So I apologize. My husband says, you say I'm a lot. And anyways, okay, getting back to, um, I am not an artist. So I do my best and Google is my best friend. So I will always sometimes um, Google an image, sometimes, not always, but sometimes will Google image um, if I'm looking for something specific. And I can usually kind of copy it and draw it. I do that a lot for my alphabet anchor, anchor charts because they'll say, <laughs> looking like dolphin. I don't know how to draw a dolphin. And it's something that, again, it's purposeful and meaningful because it's coming from the students right then in the moment. So I can't pre-print the pictures because I don't know that I don't know what the students are going to generate. So it's not something that I can prepare necessarily ahead of time. But I can say, oh, I don't really know how to draw a dolphin, but I'm going to look at a picture of a dolphin. And, and then I can look at a picture of a dolphin and I can I can try to duplicate it the best that I can. But if you're unsure um, and you're you know, you just feel like you're just not capable of doing that. You and you can't draw your own art. You can always print out clip art. And there are tons and tons. There's clip art on Teachers Pay Teachers. There's free clip art. There's free clip art for teachers. And you can always print things out and then have that ready. And again, that would be only for things that you kind of have an idea of where the anchor chart's going to go, not necessarily the student generated ideas. So um, I strongly encourage you, please, please, please do anchor charts, even if you feel like, you know, they're not Pinterest worthy. There's no such thing, in my opinion, because your students will love it. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter that somebody pins it on Pinterest. It, that does not matter. What matters is that it was meaningful to your students and that your students understood the content because you worked together to build it. So don't be intimidated by it. Don't be intimidated by Pinterest. Don't be intimidated by what you see on Instagram and all the fabulousness. That's awesome. And I love some of the anchor charts I see, and I wish that I could do that. But I, I'm not an artist, so I'm just going to do my best and I'm going to use the tools that I have. So please don't be intimidated. Please use anchor charts, even if you have to um, print out your own clip art. All right. What to include on an anchor chart? You want to include always the title or concept or standard. So a lot of my anchor charts, since I'm in kindergarten, have the I can statements. So I um, just shared one yesterday that, oh, I can share one right here. This is um, this is from this is an anchor chart that. I did a couple months ago. Actually, my student teacher did it. I'm realizing now. But um, this anchor chart is um, I can use two dice. And so it's using the I can statements. So I can use two dice. And it's showing them, you know, how what what it means to use two dice and how you count the numbers and how you add it all together to get the sum or the answer at the end. So always include the title or the concept of what you're working on. And then some things to think about is definition, keywords, vocabulary, labels, strategies, examples. Those are all important things to include on an anchor chart. Now, every single anchor chart is not like that. I can share this with you. And that is um, from doing word families. And this is just, a, we're working on the word family op. You can see I'm, I'm not um, an artist because it's just a simple house, but only the people that have the last name op live in this house. And so, again, you can see the interactive part because the kids have come up and um, have told me the word or the, you know, that's going to go into the op house. And they have actually taken the marker and they have added to this word family chart. Now, this is not a chart that um, is something that I need to write tons of vocabulary on or the definition or anything like that. This is something that we're just doing together to enhance the word family lesson that we're working on. Um, so now that you have um, the purpose behind it and the tools to use it and what to include on an anchor chart, now what? 
now what? You've tried it, now what do you do? So, excuse me. Um, here is an example, again, of my classroom where you can see I have all of my um, alphabet anchor charts hanging up. Again, here's my uh, clothespins that are on my like math wall. And every time that we have a math lesson where we have an anchor chart, you can see the one underneath of it because I'm just putting them on top of each other. One year when we did blends, we had tons and tons of blend um, anchor charts and we just had, we just covered the wall with them. They were overlapping, but the kids actually loved it. Um, here, so this, these are actually pictures from last year, but it's funny because you can see um, kind of some of the same anchor charts from last year. And I will also address that right now. I am a true believer in recreating the anchor charts every year. So I do not save any um, to bring back the next year. Because again, I want it to be meaningful to my students. So I'm not going to, um, you know, save this anchor chart for next year. Even though this particular one, the three laws of writing, it doesn't necessarily have anything personal like a graph or a voting one would or a name, you know, how many letters in our name. Um, what it even though it doesn't have those personal effects of it, I want my kids to take ownership. I want my kids to know that I care, that I cared enough to do it with them together. Now, if you disagree, that's okay. But I just am a big believer. I don't save my anchor charts. I give them away at the end of the year. Last year, I saved them all and I took them to um, a teaching conference where I shared them with other teachers so they could see. But um, no, I do not. Um, I do not keep them year after year because I want my kids to be a part of that process. So you can see some of my anchor charts back here. Back here on this side, actually, of my classroom, I have this little bar that I got from Ikea. It's like almost like a towel bar. And I just got book rings, metal book rings. And I just laminated. I had a volunteer laminate all of my anchor charts. Again, I realize that a lot of you don't have that luxury. But at our school, we're allowed to use a laminator. So I laminated every anchor chart and I punched holes in them. And then I, I hung them on a on a rack. And then that way we could refer back. So for instance, we have tomorrow and Friday, and then we have all of next week. And then we go on winter break. Well, I don't know about you guys, but when we come back from winter break, it's like I have to teach, you know, the rules and the routines and the expectations all over again. So it's great that I've already covered, you know, how to use the, our school supplies and what the um, library rules are and what the rules for a sensory table are. So I just pull those anchor charts back out and we just cover. Remember at the beginning of the year, we talked about blah, 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 blah. Oh, do you remember that so-and-so said scissors are not for cutting hair? And oh yeah, they suddenly remember. So that's one of the um, powerful reasons why I do keep them for the entire school year so that I can pull them back and, um, and share with students. I got a new student last week. So again, it's a great tool to pull out and say, hey, we wanna share the rules and the routines with you. And this is what we talked about. So I have them, um, I keep my anchor charts wherever, wherever it's most um, purposeful. So for instance, the library rules, even though we might have done it in my whole group area, it's gonna go into the library because that's where, that, that's where it's purposeful. Here's an idea, um, this is not mine, but taking command hooks. And then just a tension rod and again, having those book rings and you can keep your um, anchor charts that way. Uh, you can roll them up. Oh, I will just also say the, none of these are my ideas. These were I just found these on Pinterest and I thought I would share them because they're great ways for hanging anchor charts or, or storing them and keeping them, especially if you don't have space. One of the ideas is to roll them up, put a rubber band around them or a paper clip or a binder clip. And then you'll want to put a little label on it so that you know what, what it is. And then um, put them in a trash can or um, some sort of bin so that you can find them later. Another teacher, she did dowel rods. Same concept. She took a dowel rod and had um, the anchor charts hole punched with rings and then hung by a ribbon. So a nice fancy way to do it. Another idea for using anchor charts in the classroom is to have a um, specific wall for them. So like a math wall or a what we're learning wall. And then the kids always know, you know, where to look for those specific anchor charts. 
I'm actually going to see if I can go back. And I wanted to add, I personally don't have any of these particular ones in my classroom, but if you do not have space and you can't roll them up and you know, you want another option, another option would be to take a picture, you know, with your phone of the anchor chart and then to print it out in like a five or a four by six. And you can either make a ring of those specific ones, or you could do like the little Ikea frames um, with the little small binder rings and then have them, you know, have them displayed like that. So again, I don't have any of those because I have plenty of room in my classroom to keep my anchor charts out and about. But if you don't have room, that is an option that you could, um, you could utilize. All right, here's some anchor charts that work for kindergarten. So I'm hoping that a majority of you guys are kindergarten teachers or primary teachers, either early childhood or kinder first um, grade. These are anchor charts that I personally have created in my classroom with my students, and I know for a fact that they work. One of the things that I learned when I first started teaching kindergarten, even though I had already been a mom and I had already taught second grade, I moved to kindergarten and I did something called a suicide. And what a suicide is, is when you assume that they know things. And so I came into kindergarten and I assumed they knew how to use scissors and I assumed they knew how to use crayons and I assumed they knew how to use these things. Well, I found out very quickly, and if you're laughing with me, that's okay, because I laugh at myself all the time. I found out very quickly that they do not know how to use these supplies and these tools. And so I used to start off um, the very first day of school having crayons out on the table. And there would be crayons, and there would be something for them to color. And I found out two things. One, they would sit down, some students would sit down and scribble, scrabble, and that would be the end. And then they're coming up to me and saying, teacher, teacher, teacher. And I'm trying to console a crying child or a crying parent or, you know, helping, helping, you know, trying to make those connections on that first day of school and, um, you know, all the busyness and somebody's already scribble scrabbled and that's the end of it. Um, or they are breaking the crayons um, and it just it just was a disaster. And so I, I said, I have got to change this. So I changed my first day um, routine. So it was a more open-ended activity. And then on that very first day, I introduced crayons. And I introduce, um, I do it by an anchor chart. And we talk about these are crayons. And then together, you can see this is not fancy. I didn't print out the words. This is just my scribble scrabble kind of handwriting. It's, you know, I'm not a hand letterer. It's just, it's just real. I, together with the students, we made this anchor chart on what we use crayons for and what they're not for. And you can see their generated answers and they love it. And they will remind each other, oh, crayons are not for putting in someone's hair. Crayons are not for writing on the table. And it's very, very powerful. So I do this for each supply that we use in kindergarten. So um, I never introduce a, a supply that the students use. So crayons, pencils, erasers, dry erase markers, dry erase, dry erasers, um, whiteboards, scissors, glue sticks, glue sponges. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, just anything, any specific supply that my students use in the classroom, we do an anchor chart before we practice the first time using them. So they know their expectation and they know my rules for what I expect of them. And then this way, it also, I learned from my principal, you know, years again, when I first started teaching kindergarten, he said, you can never consequence a student that didn't know their expectation. And I never forgot that because that is so true. It's like, again, when I first started teaching and I was like, well, don't you know you don't break the crayons? No, honestly, you know, some of them might, but there are some students that actually don't know. And so I just take that element out and I just start fresh and I just say, okay, these are my expectations. We don't use crayons for this. And then if that happens, then I can always refer back to that anchor chart and say, do you know why you're getting a timeout? And they'll usually say, yeah, because I wrote on, you know, I, I cut my friend's hair. And then I'll say, well, let's look at the anchor chart. Remember when we made this? You know, this says we, you know, scissors are not for cutting our friend's hair or our hair. And again, it makes that connection. Um, so this is the first week of kindergarten. Again, like I said, going over supplies. Another interactive anchor chart on our names in kindergarten. So I print out their names in bubble letters and they color it, and then we count how many letters they have in their name, and then they get to come up and glue it on the anchor chart. 
I talk about good coloring and um, writing between the lines and um, headline, belt line, foot line. These are all important anchor charts, I feel like, that have been successful for me in my classroom and helping the kids understand what the expectations are. Here's some examples of literacy anchor charts. Um, three, way, rate, three ways to read a book. So reading the pictures, reading the words, retelling the story. This is another one of those anchor charts that I don't do in one day. So I might do a mini lesson on how to read the pictures. So, you know, we would put this picture on the anchor chart and then I would do a mini lesson on, yes, you, you are a reader and you can read the pictures. And then maybe the next day or, you know, the following day, two days later, we probably not. <laughs> I take that back. It probably wouldn't be the next day. It would probably be a couple weeks later. We would probably do the read the words because by that time we might have, you know, a handful of sight words and we can, we're learning how to point and read words. So we would do the read the words. And then when I do a retell the lesson or retell the story lesson, then we add that component. And then this anchor chart would go in my library. Um, I also wanted to make anchor charts more meaningful, the, the alphabet ones that we um, do together. But when I was drawing the pictures, sometimes I found my students were not as engaged and I thought, how could I make this more engaging and more purposeful for them? So at the beginning of the year, when we do our explicit um, instruction for letters, I, while I'm doing the anchor chart and they're generating the words, they also have their own journal, their own alphabet journal that is a circle map and they're adding their pictures in there as well, along with me. So we're doing it together. They're generating the answers, and together we're both um, putting them on our anchor charts. Um, rhyming, you can see this one is like where I printed off rhyming pictures, and then we did um, partners, and they determined, you know, who's who's rhymed with whose, and then we added them to the rhyming um, anchor chart. Another word family. Again, these are just pictures, pictures that are cut, you know, that I've printed out and cut out. But it's just so purposeful because the students get to come up to the anchor chart and and actually add it. This is one that I just shared on um, Instagram yesterday. It's um, my how to retell a story lesson, and I do it along with um, a retail bracelet. And so I I took a class a couple um, a couple years ago, and these retelling bracelets were a part of it. And um, I thought it was a great idea. And I came back and I did the lesson with my kids, but it was just missing an element. And so the next year when I did the lesson, I added in the anchor chart. And before I even had them use the bracelets, we created this anchor chart. And right now we're doing gingerbread, gingerbread man stories. And so we, we basically built this anchor chart, the character setting, beginning, middle, and ending of story to go along with the gingerbread. And then after we build the anchor chart, then they get the bracelets and they get to practice. And then they can always refer back to the anchor chart um, for what the bracelet, what the beads, the colors mean. So a prime example of making an uh, anchor chart interactive and then useful, purposeful for the next few months of kindergarten. Um, when I'm teaching what is a question, the difference between a question and an answer, um, this is, I'll probably do this after break. So then they generated their own questions and they put their name on it and then they came up and they got to add it to the anchor chart. Here's some digraphs um, and then the ending ing. Again, question words. So you can see there's pictures on there. These are words they've generated. Sometimes I have them come up and they get to underline the digraph. These are all interactive. Here's some writing anchor charts. So these are some different skills that I cover in writing in kindergarten, especially at the beginning of the school year. And they can always refer back to these when they go to the writing station for using shapes to draw, um, hairstyles, face styles. When you're teaching them to label, when you're teaching them how to write, what's your expectation? Does it matter really what program you use? But if you have an anchor chart to accompany whatever you're teaching, it's going to make a difference. So my kids know that when, whenever they're writing, whenever they take out their writing journals, this is my expectation. My expectation, um, now it's changed a little bit. This is a, um, an anchor chart from a couple years ago, but they know my expectation, what the process for writing is. 
um, just like this anchor chart you see back here. My anchor charts kind of evolve. So when I first did it, I did the laws of writing and I, I had this one, two, and three. And then this year, um, I, I added basically the words in bold and then we, I added some graphics to it. The spaces for writing, that's a lesson that is so fun to teach because I use spaghetti spaces and that yellow is actually pipe cleaners. So I just did pipe cleaners for spaghetti. And then um, one year I had done like those um, brown like pom-poms that I used for meatballs. But then one year I didn't have them. So I just crinkled up brown paper to make it look like meatballs. And we um, used those and it worked perfect. And they never forgot that lesson. I'm telling you, they never did. Um, more um, examples of anchor charts in writing. So teaching how to draw a setting. And um, this actually is a character card that it's a the character is the alien. And so I was teaching them how to create a setting for a character and vice versa. And so I had pulled the character card of the alien. And so I had to draw a setting to match. So this was the setting that I drew and it went along with our lesson for the day. Uh, this is, again, story starters. And they helped me to, um, you know, what could we use to start our stories? And these were different ideas that they generated. And then sometimes, of course, you as a teacher, you're facilitating. So you're going to kind of guide them and direct them um, where the lesson is going and what, you know, where, what, how, what the purpose is and what the goal is. But um, this is all from them, all from them. And then, of course, the kindergarten um, uh, writing or spelling, I should say. That is all generated from them. They told me how to spell unicorn. Again, my unicorn is not beautiful, but I always have that growth mindset that Miss Peterson, you know, is not an artist, but I'm going to try my best. Oh, she's trying her best. She's trying her best. And it really does make a difference. So here's math anchor charts. I'm going to look at the time. Woo. Um, so again, math, you could do anchor charts for everything. Doesn't matter sorting, counting, um, uh, numbers. So I do the number anchor charts from zero to 20, like I said. Comparing, decomposing. This was an anchor chart I did last year and my student teacher did it again this year for decomposing. And I just, you know, it was, it happened to be right around Thanksgiving when we were teaching decomposing. And I thought, okay, so, you know, how can I make this engaging and fun? And and so I thought, OK, a turkey has feathers. We do a lot of things with those, you know. And so I had five feathers and we thought of the different color combinations that we could make with orange and red feathers. And then we did the same thing with gingerbread. Um, and it, 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 you can you can take any kind of concept and turn it into an anchor chart that's purposeful, meaningful and interactive for the students. Addition and subtraction. Again, one of those um, anchor charts that's evolved. Um, I originally started with these, doing my anchor charts like this, so addition and what it looks like, and then I started with Miss Sally subtraction, and then the next year I just built on that idea and that concept, and then I thought about the different strategies that students need for addition and for subtraction, and so my one um, anchor chart turns into two that is attached with usually packing tape. So basically, there's a lot more strategies that can fit then can fit on just one anchor chart. So I'll attach another anchor chart to the bottom and then we have this big long anchor chart, um, but they can always refer to it for what strategies to use for addition and subtraction. So this is the start of my subtraction Sally. So it has, again, it's purposeful. It has um, what, what, what we're gonna be learning, which is subtraction and it's got the vocabulary on it and then it starts giving them the strategies. And then this is just um, clip art that um, I, well, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I can share that later. You can look on my blog. Um, I have a whole book that I, accompanies the addition and subtraction strategies. And so this is clip art that I have available with it as well. And then I just glue that on. And then we actually have this little paper hand that we can do addition and subtraction on. Here are some things that go along with themes. For, um, I do a lot of integration with science and social studies in the classroom. and so. Um, when I'm introducing a lot of things, it's a great, anchor charts is a great way to introduce it. So if you do um, 
a yeah, like a KWL chart, you know, on apples. And so we started off with, um, I think we started off with the green. So I used a green marker to add, you know, what, what we know about apples. And then we, we did orange for, or yellow, kind of yellow orange for what we learned about apples or what we want to learn. And then you use a third color. So those are just some different tricks. Again, you don't have to, but um, it works. It worked for me. This is an anchor chart for um, that was interactive. I just cut out little apple die cuts and they got to um, choose which apple they liked best after we had a taste test and they got to actually see their graph for our class. We made applesauce and I turned that into an anchor chart for how to write a recipe, how to read a recipe. And we did it together and it's a very simple and they got to make their own recipe to go along with it. But we learned that um, writers can also write recipes and readers can read recipes out of a book and that's being a part of, a, that's a part of being a reader and a writer. And uh, building an apple, so the parts of an apple, I had cut out all the parts, I had made the labels and then together as a class, we labeled the apple together. Same with the pumpkins. Then I got, I started off doing it simply like this one that just says label a pumpkin. And then the next year, which was actually last year, um, during October, I was like, okay, I, I liked how I added real seeds and, and yarn, but can I, can I make this even better? And so I made this pumpkin and then um, it had, it was like two parts. And then I made this flap that you could lift up and we could see the inside of the pumpkin. And oh my word, that was a favorite. Bats, when we go into bats, labeling bats, we did a canned food drive, like a community project. So if you do um, a sock drive or a coat drive or, or um, a penny drive, these are all things that you can make an anchor chart and have kids assist and have them um, show their learning and show what they're doing and they can really make that connection with it. Gingerbread, so graphing our favorite gingerbread books, labeling the parts of a gingerbread. Um, when we go into penguins, a KWL chart, um, doing a, like a brace map or a tree map. These are all anchor charts. If you don't have anchor chart paper, you can always use the big butcher paper. One year uh, when I first started, it wasn't the post-it paper was not available to me. So I just literally went and just got the butcher paper, the white butcher paper, and just made sheets that were about the same size. And I like stapled them all across the top to like make my own like tear off kind of paper. And it worked. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. Uh, social studies, science, butterflies, honeybees. Um, again, you can see my honeybee one has the different parts of the life cycle of the honeybee so that they can always refer back to that. Um, my, my school counselor, she actually did this um, friend lesson with the rainbow fish, and it was so cute. I, I kept it up for the, re for the remainder of the school year because it was so cute. So she did this fish, and she was doing a lesson on friendship and what is a friend and what does it look like to be a good friend. And everybody got their own little scale to draw a picture or write of what a good friend looked like. And then they all got to add it to the rainbow fish. And then she had the, she just made um, a, a scale out of aluminum foil and then also glued it on there as his shiny scale. But this is a great example of what an interactive anchor chart looks like and it, how they refer back to it. Um, somebody asked in the prior questions about um, graphic organizers and you can kind of see like, that's kind of a circle map type of um, a web. Those are all just basically anchor charts and you can combine the graphic organizers. Here's another organizer that we use for animal research. Um, I showed them what the format was gonna look like. They were gonna be working with older um, third grade partners. And so this is what the format's gonna look like. And then they could always refer back to what the expectation was. Here's some tips and tricks for creating anchor charts. Always um, try to create a border because it helps to anchor and focus the chart. Because when you start getting, you know, four and five charts up on your walls, you wanna make sure that each chart is its own specific chart and not blending in and, you know, in a big scenery, a big mural. You want them to be their own specific um, anchor chart. And this actually comes from the Happy Teachers palette. She's the one who um, 
designed all these different borders and gives you um, examples of those so you can visit her. When creating the bones, create in pencil first. So if you're gonna create the bones of the anchor charts, um, you can always create in pencil first and then go over it with marker just so that you make sure that you have enough space because there's been times where I've thought I've had enough space and I end up having to squish it in and, and it's okay, but um, it's just a, a time saver. Um, you can write the first and the last letter of your header and then fill in the remainder letter so that you have enough room. Um, leave some white space, add color, use pictures um, to help meet your objective, just like I did with the rhyming words. Um, don't become, become too wordy. You don't want to have, again, my goal is, or in my grade level is kindergarten. So it's a, it's, it's a lot more simple. So I'm not writing, you know, definitions and tons and tons and tons like you would in the upper grade. So if you're in kindergarten or you're in primary education, you're going to want to be less wordy and um, maybe have more anchor charts, but less wordy and not too cluttered. Think about meeting your students and their needs, what they need. ESGI is amazing. I use it in my classroom. I've used it for years. I love it. I'm actually doing it right now because this is, we're at the very end of our semester. Next Friday is the last day of our semester. When report cards go out. So I'm using ESGI to, um, to help me create my report cards. But most of all, create anchor charts with your students that are meaningful and have a purpose. I promise you, if you take some of these tips tips and tricks with you back to your classroom and you make it interactive and you try to be as engaging as you can, you will see you will see a difference. The kids will love it and they will refer to it and it will warm your teacher heart because it does mine when they're like, oh, I know how to spell um, banana because banana is on our anchor chart and they run over there with their writing journal and they, you know, spell banana because they are using the environment around them, which is what we want as kindergarten teachers and primary teachers. We want them to use the environment around them to help them learn and to use those as a reference. So, but most of all, no matter if you're printing out pictures or if you're, um, creating the pictures yourself as, you know, and you're a really good artist or you're not a really good artist, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you create anchor charts with your students that have purpose and meaning and that the students will love and always refer to for the rest of the school year. So thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed it. And you can find me at kindergartenchaos.com and all the coordinating social media.